All right, well, I'd like to start this evening with a little bit of a story about a summer Thursday when uh, just a couple of blocks you know, that away from here, about 3,000 people came to see a baseball game. It was a weekday afternoon. The ballpark was inspired by Edmonds Field, where the Pacific Coast League's uh, Sacramento Solons used to play. This was an exhibition game during the week uh, between our home all-stars and a visiting team from the University of Japan. Now, 3,000 people in attendance might not sound that impressive for a businessman special at Rayleigh Field, but this was 1925. This was three quarters of a century before Rayleigh Field was built. Because across the street from where Rayleigh Field stands so majestically, so proudly, so, uh, so meaningfully today, there once stood another ballpark. Maybe al an almost exact replica of Edmonds Field, right where 5th Street, West Capitol Avenue, Tower Bridge Gateway, and Risky Lane all come together in our community. That weekday 1925 ball game was played at a place called the Japanese Ballpark, around which we have no photos today, no real records. Uh, but it also happened to be the home diamond for the Bright Athletic uh, Club, which was a single-A level baseball team uh, that was right here in our town in Bright, in the second, town, second neighborhood of West Sacramento that was part of the Sacramento County League. Now, I say this because that for a lot of outside observers, and even for many of our newer residents in West Sacramento, the story of West Sacramento is an incredibly inspiring tale. Uh, it's a rags to riches, little engine that re finally realized that it could, a Cinderella, against all odds, my fair lady, that girl from Clueless, whatever. I mean, it's, it's, the, it's this story that we all know and love and simplify. It's the frog who dreamed of being a king and then became one. It's a mashup of a simple children's story with a powerful message mashed together with a reality makeover TV show. And it's attractive because it's so simple, right? We were, stu stuff was tough and bad and then suddenly, miraculously, it's amazing. But our story in West Sacramento has always been richer than that. It's always been more colorful. It's always been full of plot twists and dead ends and surprises and amazingness. That has been the West Sacramento story from the beginning. It's just been a story full of Japanese minor league class ballparks on West Capitol Avenue where Russian and Portuguese players who were also orchard farmers would come together and play against teams from Japan in front of a crowd that was almost as big as the entire town's population. But that kind of stuff is happening all the time in West Sacramento. Or when the region's largest airport was right there behind the truck before Scapola Pie Park, uh, Sky Park turned into a mobile home park. Or when Buster Keaton and Rudolph Valentino and generations of brat packs would hang out right here and up uh, in Broderick, making this the Hollywood of the Sacramento Valley. This narrative that we sometimes have helped to create around West Sacramento, just this long, unending, exorable pro line of progress from when it was horrible to when it was wonderful, isn't our real story. Our real history is much, much richer, much more inspiring than even the stories we tell ourselves. But for most of that storyline, we've grown in this community uh, by building new things. Growing by disposing, you might call it. We've added new, energy, new neighborhoods and then proceeded to throw ourselves into those new neighborhoods with energy and vigor and lots and lots of investment. Uh, we did it first um, with the town of Washington itself in 1851 when James McDowell uh, owned a bunch of land in, in, Bro in what's today is Broderick and Washington. Um, he was a kind of a difficult guy uh, to get along with, very prone to fighting, drank a lot, um, got into several fights, uh, stabbed a guy a couple of times, and then, then, then someone else shot him. Uh, and his wife inherited the property, and she had the foresight to draw out the first town plat. That's how the Washington neighborhood uh, was first born in 1851. Uh, and so we started building there. That was the first part of West Sac. Then, just a few years later, Mike Bright, uh, who had an uh, orchard up in the northwestern part of the city, laid out a new neighborhood in Bright. And we started to put all of our excitement and our investment in this new place called Bright. Then it was south of the railroad tracks as the West Sacramento Land Company got underway and started building old, what's now called Old West Sacramento, but that, back then was New West Sacramento, the new Paris of California. And then we started building south of here, even, and then south of what would one day become the freeway, building out West Sacramento, taking over marshlands and swamplands in order to create new places, all the while forgetting a little bit about where we had come from. Then we went into Southport, 
then southern Southport, then really southern Southport, our inexorable march to find new places to habitate and new places to put our investment and our energy. And I think sometimes, even in our own community, some folks have lost track of the number of times that our, this north-south split uh, that we sometimes think about has moved farther and farther and farther and farther and south so that many people, especially outsiders, think of West Sacramento as just two places. We're Broderick and Southport. That's all there is to our community. Now, of course, almost half of West Sacramentans don't live in Broderick or Southport. Uh, they live in Bright, they live in Meadowdale, they live in Westfield, they live in Evergreen, they live in Westmore Oaks, they live in the State Streets, they live in historic Washington. Our city is a city of incredibly diverse neighborhoods, incredibly amazing places from that very first town plat laid out in 1851. But we've added and master planned new neighborhoods and often abandoning and ignoring and forgetting the neighborhoods left behind. But no more. We're done with growing by disposing. Our frontier today isn't farmland. It's not swamplands or wetlands, whatever, depending on your politics. It's not going outside of our border. That's not the frontier anymore. Today's frontier is our imagination. Today's frontier is about what can we do with the places that we already built before, many of which have become empty. And you see it all around our community already. Rayleigh Field's a great example of that. So is the Broderick Road Roadhouse, this downtown, is perhaps the, one of the most shiny beacons of that philosophy around reclaiming the places that so many had forgotten. Now you're seeing it on a new scale here in our community. West Sacramento is leading the region in the development of truly urban farms. Uh, just this, in, over the last month, we launched our very first pure urban farm in, in, in town at the corner of 5th and C Streets uh, in Broderick. On, in, on the edge of that old, old historic town of Washington that Margaret Mandawa laid out in 1851. It's a piece of property that had all the urban challenges. It had been abandoned, it had been blighted, it had brownfields, it had all of those to it. It had become a magnet for um, less than desirable activities. And we said we could do better. We, don't, we, we know someday this has the potential to be something incredible. It's an, a, an amazing location in our community with all kinds of potential. But potential doesn't feed the spirit of the neighborhood. Potential doesn't create place. Potential doesn't fight crime. Potential alone is not enough. So could we find some partners that could make that potential, that long-term potential, into something that was near-term possible and real? And what, we achieve, what we're achieving at that location, in that urban form, I, I've been calling it a quadruple bottom line, but as I thought about it earlier today, I realized it's not that at all. It's a septuple uh, bottom line. And I hope we don't get past nine, because I don't know what, what it is after that. But it's a septuple bottom line. We are recycling, and this is, to me, one of the most important. We are recycling land that we had essentially thrown away. In our quest to find new, new green fields, we had thrown away this property and so many like it. And this is an effort to recycle it and turn it into something valuable. Second, we are creating eyes on the neighborhood, activating the place once again, uh, which is essential for creating both the energy around the place, but also just the public safety around what's possible in the neighborhood. We are recreating the connection between people and healthy food uh, in neighborhoods where, the, where we often are plagued with food deserts. We are reestablishing the concept of actually growing food uh, that doesn't come in a prepackaged freezer in our own community and showing ourselves and our children how that actually works. We are activating new supply chains for restaurants that are demanding in a ways that they never have before locally grown produce, really locally grown produce. We are creating pathways for the future for future farmers. No longer are we in a world where you become a farmer because your parents were farmers and when they retire you will inherit their farm. That's not today's agricultural industry, and the only way for farmers to emerge, especially urban farmers, is to create options for growing capital and growing markets like this urban farm. And then finally, we're banking the land for future mixed-use development, the kind of development that will be appropriate for an opportunity site, opportunity site like Fifth and C. Banking it, but with interest, not like we had with a mothballing strategy before. That's the idea of the urban farm. So we announced it, I think we announced it six weeks ago. We did a groundbreaking uh, 10 minutes ago. There are already tomatoes, peppers, watermelons, squash, green beans, cucumbers, carrots, and radishes growing on that site. Um, it's been extraordinarily well received, and it will not be the last. Uh, we have our designs on lots and lots and lots and lots of properties, both stuff that we have and stuff that we hope others in the private sector will see, think of activating as well. It's not a permanent commitment. We're going to build there eventually. But we've got lots of other land to recycle in the city once we do. 
And so I would I encourage and call upon everyone in the community to think about ways that we might bring back the productivity of the land, not just in terms of creating produce, but in terms of creating place and creating community and creating pathways to opportunity. So more, more urban farms to come, well, I hope to be able to announce some soon. Uh, now, it, it isn't just about the agriculture, it's about the connections. Uh, Broderick and Washington, the neighborhood was vibrant and healthy until a bridge got built one day, and no longer did you have to stop in, on our side of the river, hang out, and uh, have a drink at the Olive Branch Saloon or the Hoffman Saloon or the Bridge House Inn while you were waiting for the one or two ferries a day that might cross. Right? The bridge made it possible to skip over Washington, to skip over Broderick, to skip over what is now West Sacramento. Uh, and so it hurt. That connection de defeated what was our, our, our strongest point in the community at the time. Today it's the reverse. Today it's the connectivity that creates our potential for community. We already are living that way, but, the, but our lack of bridges has frustrated that work. In the 60 years uh, uh, between 1911 and 1971, four bridges were built across the, West Sacramento, uh, the Sacramento River. That's essentially all of them. Uh, so between 1911 and 1971, we got four bridges. We haven't had a single one since. Not in 43 years uh, since, uh, since then have we last crossed the Sacramento River, even though the population the economic heft of this region has doubled in that time. The first one was that I Street Bridge, which lands actually just two blocks from where those tomatoes and watermelons and carrots are at 5th and C. And the I Street Bridge, I, we're very proud. This is going to be one of our most significant projects. We are prepared to, to uh, moving forward with the project in conjunction with the city of Sacramento and the federal government, which is fully funded to replace that bridge. This. I, I love the story because it's an example of how stuff in West Sac gets done. Right? This is not one of those projects where we started planning 25 years ago. We had a task force and 17 studies, and we set aside $5 now and $10 next year, and then suddenly, we, so, you know, over time, we were able to make it happen. This project happened because you know, a, a, a staffer said, hey, there's this pot of money for bridge replacement, and if we count all the different uh, on-ramps and everything as different bridges, we could qualify for enough money to fully create a new bridge. And I will tell you, most people at the time, and Art Marty Tuttle and Mike Lucan who were involved in this process, a lot of the folks said, that can't be possible. If there was such a pot of money, someone would have already gone for it. Right? For those of you who are stock market econo economists, right, this is a rational, rational actor hypothesis, that there's no way such a thing could exist because someone would have already taken it. So that's a waste of time. We said, well, maybe it is, but it will take us 15 minutes to write this application. So we are going to go for it. And so the city of Sacramento and we together applied for this program, and we got it. And we essentially instantly got $80 million. Uh, it's the federal government, so it's going to take a while for the checks to all arrive over time. Um, but we essentially got an entire bridge project between last year's speech and this year's speech. That is... That, 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 I mean, So I say that, that that's, it's, when people say, how do you do things in West Sac? It's not magic. It is that it is having talented people who are enabled to take risks and to do things that, that might have a payoff. Right? We've never been so confident in our community that we added all, all the answers that we weren't willing to take a chance on something amazing. And so I'm very, uh, this was not a council action. This was, the, this was our staff saying, let's take a chance on this. Let's do it. I'm willing to set aside my workload for an hour today to make this happen, and they did. And it's the hallmark of how we try to do business in our community. Now, when that bridge, new bridge gets built, and, and everybody asks me, well, are, so why are you tearing down the old one? We're not tearing down the old one. Uh, Union Pacific, which owns the, other, the old one, will make a decision about how it's going to handle that in the future. But the rail, the rail bridge is staying. We're building a new bridge across the river that will still land for cars, but primarily for pedestrians and bicyclists and everyone else at the same location essentially, at C Street in, in Old Washington. Um, but the removal of that connection between that, that, that bridge entrance and the rail is going to open up the Washington waterfront again. The old, that old town plat that Margaret McDowell laid out in 1851 will reemerge. You can't see a lot of it today. You can't see where the Olive Branch Saloon was and the Hoffman Saloon and the bridgeway in. You can't see them because the bridge uh, viaduct is there. We are about to rediscover our history uh, our, one, our 1851 history um, in the Washington area. Uh, and you'll see when, when we do that, it wasn't some sort of bucolic scene. There were canneries uh, and shipyards and lots of activity and industry because that's what West Sacramento has always been about, which today has led to, to Washington Square. 
And so that part of our waterfront is about to emerge once again. Uh, and so as we think about the future of West Sacramento, I want to remind us our last big boom in this community was mainly played out in Southport. We had lots and lots of great successes all over the city with River Points and downtown and, and lots of investments all over the community. But most of the growth, most of the population was in Southport in our last boom. In this, this coming boom, the boom that has just begun, it's the riverfront. Right, there still will be more growth in Southport, there will be more growth elsewhere in the city, but it is the riverfront from that I Street Bridge area, from Broderick and Washington, through uh, Rayleigh's Landing, through the Bridge District, and into the Pioneer Bluffs and Stone Locks District, which I'll talk about in just a moment. But it is that riverfront spine, the era of the waterfront that is upon us, um, that even now we are adding as many people this year and next as we had in all of West Sacramento for the first 25 years of our existence. This is a significant change in the uh, center of gravity of our community, returning us to our roots as being a waterfront city that is integrated and connected in deep ways with our sister across the river. Uh, even in the Bridge District, uh, which you, is, is everyone in the region, everyone, every visitor to the region, everyone that lives in this place can see the scale of activity that is happening there. And no one asks why. No one ever says, why is all that happening there? Everyone knows because it's the most obvious it's the most obvious project you can imagine. Finally, someone is building on the waterfront. And not just someone, there's three projects going on there all simultaneously with the Habitat Project, the Park Moderns Project, uh, and the Rivermark Housing Project all happening together. And then as you may have read, the City Council uh, last, uh, last week approved the Barn Project, which is going to be something really spectacular. Um, not spectacular in the sense that it's going to be, uh, you know, the, uh, the, it's, it's not going to be a, a, a you know, museum a, a, a scale building for Spain. It's going to be spectacular because of the energy and the life that it brings to the bridge district and to the, the complete waterfront on both sides of the river. As a center of food and a celebration of food, as a center of entertainment, a celebration of entertainment and sustainability, and simply reconnecting, reclaiming the waterfront space that for so long had been forgotten. The, the, uh, the, if you were at Sacktoberfest last year, you already know what this is going to feel like because the level of energy and excitement and connection, the sort of visceral, guttural sense that we belong here right on the waterfront uh, will reemerge once again with the construction of the barn. And not coincidentally, it's going to be at the site of what was the largest rice mill in the United States when it was built a century ago because that's our history here in West Sacramento as we're not just, we didn't just become a food hub last year. <laughs> We've been a food hub since day one. Uh, and the celebration of that long, la that long standing commitment to all aspects of what it means to be about food began more than a century ago, but that rice mill is being honored in essence by the construction of, of the barn. And even in between the old Washington neighborhood and the bridge district, we're already seeing uh, folks with projects making their way through the, through the system that will blend those two districts together. And so all of old Washington is about to re-emerge in ways that we might not have expected before. Now, and then of course there's what was approved last night by the, by the city council of the city of Sacramento. Uh, which was the entertainment and sports uh, center, the arena project, which is a massive, has a massive potential uh, impact for our community. I shouldn't even say potential, it will have a massive impact on, on our community and for our community. And so I want to congratulate, publicly congratulate the city of Sacramento for, for taking the plunge. We know because we did this with Rayleigh Field and this project is about uh, 10 times bigger than Rayleigh Field and the city of Sacramento is almost 10 times bigger than us. So I get the scale of it. This is a big leap of faith for the city of Sacramento, but it is what the big boys do if you're the biggest city in the region. And we will be a part of that. And the Bridge District is going to be a part of that, the Washington neighborhood, but all of West Sacramento is going to be a part of the arena project. And we, that's why we've been such significant supporters of it. Because asking things like who benefits more from something, Sacramento or West Sacramento, is a ridiculous question. Right? We, even we used to think about it that way. Sacramento versus West Sacramento. And who's going to pay this and who's going to pay that and who's going to win more and who's going to win less. And to me, that question is like, is, if, uh, if, since the principle of River City is here, I'm going to go into science. It's like, the sci it's like asking, is light a wave or a particle? Yes, it's both of those things. It doesn't make any sense, but it is both. And we are both of independent, fully sustainable city and we are part of an urban core that exists with the city of Sacramento. And virtually, with the possible exception of Bill Kristoff, all, virtually everyone in both places experiences both places in an integrated way. 
right? So when we, when we, when, when we used to say, we used to say we're going to protect our levees, but, for, you know, but at the, if, if it means Sacramento's levees uh, fail, then too bad on them. But then I think many of us thought, well, but what about if I'm, at, if I'm at a restaurant in Midtown? What if I'm at Patrick Mulvaney's restaurant in Midtown when the levee fails? What if my daughter is in childcare uh, when the levee fails? What if my son's at, at Sac State in, in a class when the levee fails over there? I don't just, even though I own a home here, I go to sleep here, I'm on the city council here, I don't live every aspect, every moment of my life here, and my life is enlivened by our integration with Sacramento. And it's just starting to get even way too complicated for us to have, those, have the calculations happen anymore. I asked in a, in a streetcar meeting earlier in the year, so how, if we're gonna say that this business is in Sacramento, this business is in West Sacramento, let's charge the streetcar to one or the other as a, as a benefit. So if you're looking at the sale in here in West Sacramento and it's being operated by folks from Shady Lady in Sacramento and one of them happens to live in West Sacramento but the other one doesn't, most of the people that are drinking there are on the way home to Southport from a job that they had in Sacramento. How, where do you put that on your spreadsheet? Right? If, I, if you go over to and have a cup of coffee at Insight Coffee in Sacramento, you're like, okay, that's a Sacramento benefit right? because they got the tax revenue. But Insight Coffee, two of the three owners are residents of West Sacramento. So when the profits... They get, they get spent here by their families. Is that a West Sacramento benefit or a Sacramento benefit? If Broderick, which has its, Broderick, is, Broderick Roadhouse is here, but you go and you eat at their establishment in downtown Plaza, and, but then you go the next day and you eat at their place at Rayleigh Field, did the, which one was Sacramento, which one was West Sacramento? It's a dumb question. No longer should we be thinking about that simply that where I sleep at night, where I own my home is the only thing that matters. Our success, our health, our vibrancy depends on both places emerging and succeeding and being, becoming vibrant together. Uh, and so let's not settle for that any longer. I mean, you know, e even, even Fix 50 kind of really showed, uh, you know, the stupidity of that. I mean, all of Fix 50 was happening across the river, but most of the impacts were felt here at least in phase one, because we are inextricably interconnected, and that's a good thing. I want to be able to enjoy everything that, that Midtown has to offer, and I want Midtowners to be able to enjoy everything that we have to offer now and everything that we are creating, because what we are creating will not succeed without them. We don't have the population base to create all the great places that we want to have in our community all alone. This has to be a collective effort. And br the bridges that we are building together are a demonstration of that. They are also a remarkable statement of what I think is the strongest relationship between our two cities that has ever been. It doesn't mean we agree on everything. I've, I'm fighting with the city of Sacramento folks daily about, who, about you know, who's responsible for this, who pays for that, who submits that application. But that's what we do, that's what we do that inside City Hall too. The point is that we now have two bridges in process with the city of Sacramento. We have the streetcar system in process with the city of Sacramento and an untold number of joint projects. This, our relationship has never been stronger and it couldn't be at a more important time. Because these bridges are essential to our city's future and to the region's future. Because the streetcar are essential for the success of the Entertainment and Sports Center, they're essential for Rayleigh Field, they're essential for the Bridge District and for our downtown as they bring us together. And our win on the streetcar this year, if you haven't heard about it, was enormous. We got, just, just uh, earlier this month, the green light from the federal government that we are now a federal project. Uh, and we are now, we've now been invited to begin the work to apply for a federal full funding grant agreement, which is exactly what it sounds like, except that it's federal, so federal means that full now means 50%, or uh, so it, you know, whatever. But close, that's still, that's still a lot of money. That's like still $75 million. So this is a, we, we just reached a gigantic milestone on a streetcar project that many of you will have to admit when we first launched this idea, uh, seven years ago, that many folks were like, well, that, that, that might be a nice thing, but that's never going to happen. It's happening. Uh, and it's happening because so many folks in this room, uh, Jack Enos from CalSTRS and Mark Friedman from the Bridge District and other private sector and, and government sector leaders who've been essential in moving this forward, the Kings who stepped up with a half million dollars early for the project, and then both cities and both transit districts working together to make this a reality. The streetcar is real, it is coming, coming and it will be open soon. Now, thanks. So we started at incorporation in 1987 uh, with essentially no public urban waterfront, really none. I mean, what we had was the Broderick boat ramp. River access almost anywhere else was 
Um, it was, there was some good access, but it was all illegal. Right? Well, that was it. We had, a, we, had, we had one of the region's best boat ramps, and that's all for a city that in the winter can be fully surrounded by water. That was the state of our waterfront. And soon, because of what is happening in Washington and Rayleigh's Landing and the Bridge District, Pioneer Bluffs and Stone Lock, we, are, we may have more than three miles of activated waterfront in this community. That's an incredible accomplishment for what, went, what when we started was one of the poorest communities in the region. But the focus that everyone in the city had, every neighborhood, every socioeconomic group in this neighborhood said, take care of the waterfront. We want to take the waterfront back, and we are. Now, later this year, we're going to be opening up our first new bridge in 17 years. Uh, it almost feels like it's a secret Christmas present that we're holding because almost nobody knows that it's happening. Right? It's, it's not like we have been not saying it, but the site where the construction is taking place is almost totally out of public view. Um, but this Mike McGowan Bridge is going to be a game changer. The, uh, the Mike McGowan Bridge connects... Uh, it, I, I want to say it, re, it restores South River Road to its prior glory probably before the port. But uh, the Mike Ma McGowan Bridge connects the north to Southport in our community and it provides a critical secondary alternative to Jefferson Boulevard, as the, as, which is the primary uh, north-south arterial in our city. So that's how transportation planners describe it. But what the Mike McGowan Bridge really means, it means that that entire stretch of urban waterfront is about to re be reclaimed for the public. What it really means is that once you drop off your kids, at, at, uh, well, hopefully not, once your kids walk to River City and you've said goodbye to them and you've gotten your cup of coffee, that your ability to get to work or to get back to pick them up after work is going to be immeasurably improved. But it also means that we're going to be able to transform even more astonishing places. That as you all move into and celebrate and enjoy the Bridge District, that we will have new frontiers in those existing urban places that we had so long ago thrown away. This is part of the general plan from the very beginning. This is, when, when this starts to happen, when you start to see the amazing transformation that's about to occur south of the freeway in the old industrial area, don't think that this is some you know, amazing invention of me or the current city council. We're doing what we can to make sure that it becomes a reality, but this was part of our general plan from the very beginning, from that very first city council that said, we are gonna create the most spectacular waterfront, uh, at least in the region, and I think all we've done since then is say, well, maybe we can take it even up a notch and we're gonna make the most spectacular uh, waterfront in the country. And we really have that possibility because the Mike McGowan Bridge will connect South River Road, Riverfront Street, essentially, that runs through the Bridge District that will run right by the barn, continue down uh, into the uh, Pioneer Bluffs District, and connect to Village Parkway and Southport. Village Parkway being the primary, uh, one of the two primary uh, arterials in Southport. So suddenly, when this new bridge is done, and then Village Parkway is, is connected to it a year later, uh, we will have a, um, instant access by thousands of residents going back and forth on a Riverfront Street and a whole new uh, district opened up uh, for our enjoyment. So if you're not part of the general plan process, join us as we try to envision exactly how we're going to make the Pioneer Bluffs and the Stone Lock area into a reality. But the potential that is there is something that is enormous. If you thought what we're do what's happening now in the Bridge District is incredible, we know that the, that's an inspiration for what we think we can accomplish in these two new districts as well. And it's returning to West, old West Sacramento, right? Southport's had it, had, it has its time, Washington has its time. West, old West Sacramento is also about 100 years old now, uh, I think last year. Uh, and the area around 15th and Jefferson that was the heart of Old West Sacramento will be restored to its old glory as a result of the new bridge at Broadway, uh, which we have re re received regional funding to begin work on. And why that's important is for two reasons. One is we have money to begin work on the Broadway Bridge, and two, that money is in the bank account of the city of Sacramento, which means we're both jointly committed to actually doing this. Right? This is not a talk. The Broadway Bridge, like the streetcar, is a real project, and both cities are fully and financially committed to making it a success. And I want to publicly acknowledge City Councilman Steve Hansen from the City of Sacramento, um, who when he was elected, uh, when he was elected uh, said, I, we're not fighting with West Sacramento anymore. I mean, we'll fight with them over the little stuff, but no more cutthroat competition. Because he gets it. He, he's biked over to Bike Dog a million times. Uh, you know, for, he loves their IPA. And he's seen West Sacramentans at Lowbrow a million times in his district. He knows that we're a common place. 
He knows what happens when we bring people together rather than separate them apart. And so from the moment of his election, he turned a skeptical Sacramento into an enthusiastic one for both bridges and for the streetcar project. And for that, I thank him. So we've got some incredible projects happening on our waterfront, and I'm giving just a, a sneak preview of what's possible and then an invitation to join us in the planning of them. But I want to give you a warning label about them as well. Uh, because some of the progress that we're uh, seeing on the, on, the, on the long waterfront, on this three-mile waterfront that I've described, is threatened by the Bay Delta uh, Conservation Plan and some of the massive water projects that have been proposed in, around, and through the Delta, but not just for the reason that you might think. Um, I, I've represented West Sacramento and Sacramento, uh, and also Isleton, on the state's uh, Delta Protection Commission for 15 years now. And with Mike McGowan and Oscar Villegas at the county and Chris Ledesma as my partner on the city council here, we have fought really hard to rescue the Delta, uh, its ecosystem, its economy, and its people from threats from uh, the massive uh, infrastructure projects, uh, while also recognizing the Delta needs a repair. And we fought hard and objected loudly to provisions, both of the Bay Delta plan and the conveyance plans uh, and others that would trample on us here in West Sacramento and also our little sister town to the south in, Cl in Clarksburg. But I want tonight to peel back a little bit of the curtain on what some of the most fiery of my Stop the Tunnels friends have been uh, saying in our community. Because the al alternative that's been put out there so far to the tunnels is actually for us much, much worse. Uh, and we need to look at this with our eyes open. So what is that alternative? And, and if you have a glass of wine in your hand, I put it down and hold on to your seats because it's bad. So the alternative that's been put forward to the tunnels uh, in our community is rerouting the tunnels, rerouting the peripheral canal through West Sacramento. The Garamendi plan, as it's called, would put a 3,000 cubic square feet per second uh, intake, water intake facility on the Sacramento River um, on the Southport waterfront right where, the, where it meets the Sacramento River and the, and the uh, Barge Canal. It's the Stonelock property. So if you read about the, uh, the, our plans for an entertainment uh, district in the Stonelock, that's exactly where what instead you would get is an intake facility that's six stories high of an industrial behemoth um, on 40 acres of our triple waterfront. Uh, then the plan calls for pumping the water from the river at that location in West Sacramento into our Barge Canal. Then it would flow into the port's turning basin then it would go down, use our deep water ship channel as the new peripheral canal to send water off through a pipe to Southern California. That our deep water ship channel, which the ships go in, uh, would then somehow be sealed, ho sealed off at the southern end so fish and presumably humpback whales can't come up the deep water channel any longer. So not only would we lose our prime waterfront and end up with this gigantic industrial thing on, on, our, on our riverfront in Southport, you can probably guess that Southern California wouldn't be too happy about us running ships up and down their drinking water aqueduct. We'd almost certainly lose the port and the companies that depend on it and the jobs that depend on the port and those companies. Uh, we would lose um, our ability to provide service to the rice industry and to the rice, in, uh, rice farmers in our region. The implications for our town and for the entire Sacramento region um, and its farmers are really staggering. So I, I'm not a fan of the tunnels plan either. Uh, Mike and Oscar both know this, but the Stop the Tunnel folks, either they're not being honest with us or they just haven't bothered to read the details of Congressman Garamendi's plan because that alternative to the tunnels, which they're banding about, is a bullet to the heart of West Sacramento. So that's why we're working so closely with Oscar Villegas now that he's a county supervisor and Congresswoman Doris Matsui who are championing the real solutions that we need for the Delta that will protect all of the Delta, including this part of the Delta, uh, West Sacramento. Now, one other thing that the Stop the Tunnels folks aren't telling you about the alternative, shooting 3,000 cubic square feet of water per second down the deep water channel, it, it's currently not handling that at all. We don't shoot any water into the deep water channel. If you've been by the lock, you see there's no, there's no, there's no connection to the river. We don't shoot anything. Shooting that much water that fast down the deep water channel uh, is gonna scour the sides of the channel. Uh, that wouldn't be so much of a problem except what we call the sides of the channel, um, our flood folks that call levees, right? And so those channel walls are the critical federal levees that protect our city from catastrophic, catastrophic flooding. So uh, you can t we're not let, gonna let this happen and we're gonna need your help to make sure that it doesn't um, because uh, we need the port, we need agriculture in our region and we definitely need our flood protection. And speaking of flood protections, I wanna talk about something a little more positive. Um, we're about to start construction 
uh, on, and improvements on our major Southport levy project this coming spring. Um, and it, it doesn't generate the kind of applause that the barn or Rayleigh Field or the arena generates, but it ought to uh, because, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Because the South, this Southport project, it's the, largest, it's the largest flood protection we've ever undertaken in West Sacramento by far. It's going to dramatically strengthen the levees and the whole flood management system on the river side of our city. And taken together with all of the projects that we've already completed throughout uh, the northern part of the city, throughout Bright and throughout Broderick, um, th this is a project that's going get to get us across the 50-yard line. Uh, when it's done, when we've done the Southport levee project, we will have completed about half of the mammoth half a billion dollar uh, levy improvement project that we had we planned around our entire city. Remember, this whole city is ringed by levies, and we had to improve every inch of them. So we're going to bring bringing them up to the latest standards of protection, and we'll be halfway there with the Southport project. Now, that we're able to achieve that kind of um, significant progress towards uh, complete flood protection of our city without any federal authorization, without any federal appropriation is unprecedented in the country, right? There's no other place that has taken on a challenge of this scale for a community of our size and said, hey, we're just gonna do it ourselves. We're, we're, we're gonna need your help, but we're not waiting uh, for you to do that. And it is entirely because of you, the people, the citizens, the property owners of West Sacramento who stepped up to locally finance the first half of what seemed like six years ago to be just a completely impossible task. But we are doing it. And it's uh, thanks to Congresswoman Doris Matsui, who you know, we thanked her earlier tonight, but we can't thank her enough, because um, yesterday the House of Representatives passed uh, new legislation that you've probably heard about, because it's a huge win for flood protection in our region. And the provisions that apply to Natomas will apply to us in the future, and so it's critically important for us. But it, this new legislation also encapsulates years of work that Congresswoman Matsui, Senators Boxer and Feinstein, uh, my mayoral friends in other cities across the country and us have been doing to fix this antiquated part of the federal crediting mechanism that has threatened to not count all the money that we've spent on our local levies towards our ultimate federal match, which would be crazy. Uh, but it would also mean that we'd have to call an immediate halt to all levy projects in the city, and we would have no way of paying for any more in the future. That's in, we've been put in an untenable position. This new legislation that the House passed yesterday and that Cong uh, Senator Boxer will be taking up in the Senate next week um, helps to fix that problem uh, for us. And so thank you to Congresswoman Metsui and, and both Senator Feinstein and, and Boxer for being really relentless advocates with us and to our partners in the Sacramento Office of the Army Corps of Engineers who worked really hard with us to keep our, um, for, the, for you flood geeks here, our, our GRR, our General Reevaluation Report, on track. Uh, which is essential because even with the legislation, if we don't make, pr if we don't get that GRR done, we don't get credit either. And so we, uh, we've had to have a perfect storm of solutions occur, and they have been, and it's been thanks to all of you and to our federal advocates, um, our, our federal delegation, and our, our colleagues at the Army Corps of Engineers. And I particularly want to thank you, uh, those of you who stepped up last year when I issued a call, a plea for help on the issue of our regional blueprint and land use sustainability. The West Sacramento Chamber of Commerce uh, spoke up loudly and clearly. Uh, about the importance of, of, of maintaining our commitment to sustainable land use development and that regional plan. And I've heard loud and clear repeatedly, from, especially from Senator Feinstein, but from our entire federal delegation, how important that was in sustaining our strong rep reputation as one of the few places in, this, in the country that they can trust as a responsible floodplain city. Um, so thank you for uh, helping us to avert that project, uh, that, that crisis. I actually think it deserves a toast, but we're at a bike dog, uh, a bike dog, a bike, bike dog beer. So let's let's get there some other time and grab a growler or two of bike dog beer. We were proud today to be able to acknowledge the work that bike dog has done um, uh, in in helping us to advance our community in ways that aren't the obvious ones. They're not the co they're not the company that's hiring a thousand people, right? They're not the gigantic plant. Uh, they're not the they're not the kings, right? They, but they are what makes a community a real place. An authentic, an authentic uh, gathering place, an authentic business, and an authentic set of local entrepreneurs. They're also really promoting biking in our community, which uh, uh, you can probably guess by the first name in their, in their title. Which is, I, I say this every year, but I want to emphasize how much biking is taking off in this community and why that matters so much. We this year uh, won our national designation as a bike-friendly community. There are very few uh, cities in California that have this designation. We do. Uh, thanks to the improvements that have been made and thanks to more and more folks biking in our city overall. 
Uh, and we are about to embark, we are embarking on what has been lauded nationally as one of the most visionary bicycle plans in the country uh, for our emphasis on creating low stress alternative routes, as an example, uh, for, for, for cyclists to be able to get places without having everybody have to go onto Jefferson. By things like the Clarksburg Bl Branch Trail that we improved this year to make it, uh, uh, to make it easier for cyclists, for walkers, for strollers, for wheelchairs, uh, and for horses, uh, and for improvements that are to come on the Clarksburg Clarksburg Branch Trail, including improvements connecting that trail on Linden that, that Councilmember Ledesma has, has pressed like a, like a dog on, like a bike dog on, in order to make it safer for children uh, to get to, uh, to River City High School and also to Our Lady of Grace uh, School. Uh, so we've got that project going. And uh, an, another invisible project but that's critical is a sycamore, the sycamore connection that we are drawing all through the east, uh, the west side of our city to connect north and south to connect all communities of our community together, to make it possible to, to bike, for example, from Bright or from Broderick or from Westfield or from Meadowdale to River City High School, to the Nugget or back or to the Rec Center without having to go on Jefferson. We are creating uh, bike boulevards that are underway in Bright as well. We are really putting it out on the line for biking and for pedestrians because that's the future of our urban city. Uh, if we learn nothing else from Fix 50, we did learn that. Um, and uh, just for a plug, next weekend on May 31st is uh, the Tour de West Sac, which is a bike ride, a casual bike ride. Despite its name, it's not a race. Uh, and, and despite, it, but despite its name, we are not allowing any any uh, performance-enhancing drugs. This is a ride led by led by uh, City Councilman Chris Ledesma. Uh, it's a casual one, uh, but May 31st, the Tour de West Sac. And next, year, we're going to be shooting for silver, silver designation next at the as a bicycle friendly uh, community. But it's not just about biking when we talk about Bike Dog because Bike Dog is also a, in the vanguard of our beer and hops revival. Hops were one of the very first crops uh, that were popular here in West Sacramento in Bright uh, in particular, uh, you know, 100 years ago. Uh, they, uh, and then as, I, as many of you know, West Sacramento was the only part of Yolo County and I think the only part of Sacramento County that voted against uh, closing down the saloons during prohibition. We kept ours uh, open as long as we could. This is a rich part of our history, we believe. We believe in our beer. Uh, but Bike Dog uh, both said, we're going to do this, but we, and, and AJ said, we didn't get any favors. But AJ said, uh, AJ said we need, your, your zoning doesn't allow us to have a tasting room. Your zoning doesn't allow this, and your zoning doesn't allow this. And in most places, the planners would say, well, okay, we'll put that on our list. And uh, if you would like to, we could do a study about the zoning. And um, it, will tr it will cost you this much to do because we will have to bring on a consultant and it's going to cost you know, $80,000. And then in a year and a half from now, we'll take it to the planning commission. They'll take a look at it and then the city council. And you know, we'll see what they say. But that's, that's typically how city governments have approached these kinds of challenges. And maybe that works if, if it was Coors that was planning on opening a brewery here. But it wasn't Coors. It was you know, four guys with a regular job who wanted to do something you know, interesting and amazing and take a lot of chances. They were putting it all on the line themselves all their own capital, all their own time, all their own heart, all their own soul. So we said, well, but why should we have you pay for a process like that? We actually, we want you to do this. We should be a partner in making it happen, not a regulatory agency alone. Now don't do it until we've approved it. I mean, let's not get crazy, but why don't we work with you to initiate the process of fixing rules like this? Right? And so I think part of what we've learned from the bike dog experience is around how, uh, how as a city government we can not just be responsive because it's not, we, we don't have the capacity to just take everybody's problem and try to rewrite all our zoning rules on, on their own, but to think, to remember that zoning is our tool. That zoning and general plans, they work for us. They are there to create the community and the place that we want and the kinds of businesses and uses that we want. The kinds of craziness, the kind of risks that we're willing to take have to be encapsulated. Right, so the hard zoning of this over here, this over there, and there shall be no, no waivers, no anything else, that made sense when we were talking about you know, smokestacks spewing toxic poison into the air and it was right next to a daycare center. Right, that, that, that's, that's where our notion around zoning really came from. We need a modern iteration of what zoning and land use controls are all about. And Bike Dog, in a very small way, but a very important way, and now the successors to Bike Dog, Jack Rabbit and Yolo Brew, um, Brewmeister and others are, are coming forward with similar proposals, but they help us to point the way to how to not just solve their problem, but to make West Sacramento a more welcoming place, not just business friendly in a generic sense, but entrepreneur friendly 
placemaking friendly in ways that will advance the kind of the kinds of places that once they happen, everyone in the community thought, why didn't this just not happen before? Now it is. And so thank you to Bike Dog for helping to lead the beer revival, but also help us to think about new ways of treating our own regulatory and zoning processes in ways that will support crazy risk takers that want to put it all on the line and make something amazing happen in our community. So uh, uh, like with our, uh, and our urban farm movement is actually the same thing, which is right. We've got a lot of rules that say you can't do that. Uh, and we're going to change those rules, even though we just opened one. Uh, I mean, we're not waiting to do a task force and six years of study. We want to make, make change happen in a way that brings authentic, unique, character-filled um, places to our community in ways that help define us as West Sacramento. And it isn't just about the small batch brewing. Um, it is about the big food stuff as well. And we've had a tremendous couple of years in our food hub. This last year has been um, incredible. Maybe in some ways the biggest since that largest rice meal in the United States opened up here 100 years ago. Um, with the, uh, it, it, actually, it wouldn't surprise me at all if some of those descendants of the baseball team players from the University of Japan in 1925, if, the, if some of their descendants turned out to have come back last year for our grand opening at Nippon Shoken or our upcoming opening at Shinmei, uh, for uh, the, the U.S. headquarters for both of these companies, uh, we have become an international destination. It's not just Asia either. Uh, you've heard about Tomra, uh, uh, which was built on and incorporated a, a, a long-standing local company, uh, but, uh, but bringing it together with a larger Scandinavian food conglomerate. And Bayer Crop Science, that would have left our region entirely if they weren't welcome here in West Sacramento, having been incubated essentially in Davis. Uh, research, manufacturing, growing, testing, distributing, cooking, importing, eating and drinking, exporting, all of that is happening. The entire farm to fork, including the two, uh, not, just the, not just the growing and the eating, but all of the food, um, uh, the, all of the food chain is happening right here in West Sacramento in gigantic ways. It's creating jobs, it's creating energy, and it's building on our strengths as a community and as a region. So uh, this has been a big time for the food hub, and we will continue to make progress towards it. Now, earlier we gave an award to the West Sacramento Foundation, and, and, I, and I want to emphasize why, this, why we did that this year. Uh, the development of our civic infrastructure in this community is just as important as our physical infrastructure. Our investment of time and resources and energy and imagination in our people, and particularly our young people, is essential in this community. Last year we launched in, this, in, in the State of the City Address Future Ready, the Mayor's Trust for, for, uh, for Youth and uh, said we were going to be working to spark projects that engage uh, kids in civic improvement, build college and career readiness for local high school students, give uh, kids a meaningful experience through employment, promote youth competency in urban transportation, try to really create the conditions for our young people in West Sacramento to succeed. And I'm proud that many, many of you joined us on the Gear Up Bike Ride, which was the launch uh, for Future Ready. Um, and uh, we raised a lot of awareness and, uh, and some, some real money to get Future Ready underway. Uh, just last month, we, we, Future Ready and the city and Google collaborated on a national Get Your Business Online uh, work with the Chamber of Commerce, West Sacramento Chamber and other partners that was wildly successful. Many of us take it for granted. But, m but many businesses, Google says most, but many businesses don't have a presence on the web and they don't know how to use that presence effectively. And so we've been working collaboratively with our local businesses and partners uh, to get them online and get them to be successful. And today, through Future Ready and work with Denise Seals um, and others on the Future Ready leadership, working to connect those same businesses with students at the West Sacramento Early College Preparatory School to help them take it to the next level and to help those kids learn how to work with business and to work how to make business successful and to connect their skills to marketing. It's a win-win, it's a double bottom line a win for, for us and for those kids and for businesses in our community and we're proud of what's happening with Future Ready. Look forward to a Makers Challenge coming soon as we, as we enter that sector. We're also working with Code for America. Uh, we're looking at options around crowdfunding in our community as, a way, as an innovative way to engage citizens in choice making and in value, um, in value re revelation in our community. Uh, West Sacramento is quietly but, but determinedly becoming a center of innovation, of entrepreneurs, and of action. Now, uh, West Sacramento, as I said earlier, is, we're special, but it is not something magic. This, this is not, it's not simply the words West Sacramento that makes it happen. It is in our people. It's in our culture. It's in our system. We have created a system in our city where citizens can engage in ways that help 
uh, to understand the interdependent nature of the choices that we make. And this is, uh, if you go to other places, uh, what, what will happen is uh, we'll have a general plan workshop as an example. I'll just pick this out. And folks will say, what do you really want in your community? And they will, then I, I, I will say, I'd say Trader Joe's, but I'm tired of Trader Joe's. Um, they'll say, I would really like to have a cool restaurant district. Can you, I, I want something that's like, kind of like Midtown, but that I could walk to in my, in my, near my neighborhood. So I, w I really want that. So that's what they say at our workshop. And then we say, okay, we'll see you in 25 years when we do our general plan again. And then the following Wednesday, we say, notice, you are within 500 feet of a piece of property, and we are considering whether to make the zoning on that property 14 units to the acre or 18 units per, per, the, 18 units per the acre. There will be a public hearing at 7 o'clock this coming Wednesday. Please, please show up if you have an opinion. That's what we ask people. And they come and they say, 14 units or, or 15 units? I, 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 I don't want to be crowded, so give me 14 units. And then we do another notice. This time we put it in the news ledger and we say we're considering whether to make our streets narrow with big sidewalks but no parking or whether we should make them wider with lots and lots and lots of free parking. And you say, well, I, I really want that, I really like that kind of midtown restaurant feel, but what I don't like about midtown is there's never anywhere to park and it's all, I have to pay for it. So I would like really wide streets with free parking. So give me that. Okay. And we say, okay. And then some project comes forward and wants to build you know, f five stories uh, and then it's going to be apartments um, and on the ground floor it'll be something else but there'll be apartments there and we they put a sign on the thing public hearing coming up next in two weeks on the apartments here and you come and you say well I don't want to I don't like apartments you know I, I don't like renters I, I, I want people to own their thing and it's too crowded so no, I don't want any apartments either uh, and then we put out that we're, gonna, we're considering a change to allow uh, the, for there to be a little bit more congestion in our downtown streets in West Sacramento we're no longer going to guarantee that you can get through a green light um, at any time of the day, no matter what, on one, on one turn of the light. And you say, oh, that's awful. I do not want that. No congestion. So I'm going to come testify against that. Do not change the level of service requirement. And while you're at it, do not allow any taller buildings um, in, in the city because I, I want to be able to see. You know, I don't want any of that stuff. So we do, that's what we do every Wednesday at our public hearings. That's what the Planning Commission does. That's how we operate. And then 25 years later, at the next general plan workshop, people say, you know what I really would like is a cool restaurant district like they have in Midtown. And you say, well, why did that not happen? Well, why it didn't happen is that in most places, those public hearings become the whole thing. Right? We forget about what we're actually trying to accomplish, and we focus on the, on the most reductionist, atomistic parts of the whole equation that there is. And we ask people stuff that they don't even know about. I don't even know this. I don't know what the difference between 14.7 units of the acre is and 15 units per the acre. But I know what I want my neighborhood to feel like. I know what I want my downtown to sound like. I know where, where I want to be able to take my family. I know those things, but you never asked me about that. You asked me about densities and street widths and stuff that I don't know about. And I keep telling you that these things that I know cannot add up to that cool restaurant district. I say that because that cool restaurant district is actually one of the top five things that every citizen in West Sacramento says they want. And yet they almost all, if we were to say, come to all these public hearings, if we had 80 people come to our city council and testify, they would all testify against every single one of the tools that we have in order to achieve it. What's different about West Sacramento is we don't do that. We don't cry if, the, if we have a public hearing on the density or the street width and nobody comes. We cry if we don't get the restaurant district that people say they want. That's the West Sacramento way. That's how we've always done it. That's what generates success. That what, that's what makes it possible for the people that really make the restaurant district, the restaurateurs, <laughs> the coffee house owners, the baristas, the folks who move into the apartment above, they're the ones that make it happen. We have to help them. We have to get out of the way. And that means looking at the bigger picture. And that's what I think we do well in West Sacramento uh, that helps to make, make success happen. Because democracy, as we've set it up, sometimes gets it all wrong at the local level. We think that we are just like the federal government. right? That it's all, and, but the federal government's all about checks and balances. It's all about stopping the king from doing bad things. But that's not what cities are. Cities aren't about stopping bad things. Cities are, are fundamentally about action. Cities are fundamentally about collision. Cities are fundamentally about change. Unless you're a university town or colonial Williamsburg, if you're a city that doesn't change, you're a city that dies. We will never be that city. We, are going, we are, have been a city that changes. We will continue to change. We will continue to make progress on behalf of our community in ways that matter. That's part of why West Sacramento uh, really, really works. And so when, when folks ask what's the secret sauce, 
There's a lot to it. That's a big part of it, is that the citizens of this community demand and expect results, and they don't want to be asked all those other questions about that, that so, so often get asked in public hearings. It's why surveys, uh, even the most recent surveys, show, and it's been consistent for years now, that West Sacramentans, more than anywhere else in the entire region, and some surveys say maybe even statewide, West Sacramentans believe that their community is on the right track by a gigantic margin. They're confident enough to invest in the future here, to take the kinds of risks on entrepreneurs like Bike Dog or on new places like, and ideas like the Bridge, Districts, Bridge District or new, new projects like the streetcar. They are prepared and confident and excited and positive about the future in ways that are essential for our long-term success. Now, I mentioned James McDonald earlier. James McDonald's the, the, the guy who uh, uh, owned, the, owned West Sacramento at the beginning, and, but for a couple of, uh, of knife, knife stabbings uh, and a gun, one gunshot wound would, uh, might have uh, pulled it off. But if he had been cryogenically preserved like Captain America and uh, woke up in the same town today, he would be astonished, uh, not just at all the technology and everything else, but at how big and cosmopolitan and how capable uh, this, his wife's town had become. Uh, because today, uh, today's West Sacramento would have been California's third biggest city back then. Today's West Sacramento would have been bigger than anywhere but LA or San Francisco. Uh, we would have been the 12th most populous city in the country. And these are cities that like invented democracy and did all kind of, you know, fought the Spanish and, 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 and made America what it is today. We are that size. So we are a small town and everything that's great about the intimacy and the authenticity, the character of a small town, but we are big enough to do amazing things, uh, including making healthy change. We're also big enough to win baseball games. Uh, by, by the way, we, we won that international baseball game in 1925 and the River Cats. Uh, and the town that they've inspired, keep on winning, and it's all thanks to you. Thank you for being part of our success, and thanks for being here tonight.